Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Sharifa Team. I'm a BCBA and a co-founder of the ABA Journal Club, which is an awesome initiative by the ABA I uh, in collaboration with the ABA I chapter, the UAE ABA chapter, and in collaboration with the Emirates College of Advanced Education. Thanks to them, they have supported to make the ABA Journal Club CEU event. So thank you so much for all that have been working very hard to make this a successful event. Um, so in our ABA Journal Club, our main focus here is to support the community of um, all BCBAs that are working towards recertification to ensure that we not only discuss about um different information that could be used but also to learn how we can pull out articles and then read about it and discuss about it and criticize it so the whole point of the aba journal club is to see whether these articles as a practitioner am i able to use this article am i able to use it to enhance my clinical work so I would like to welcome Ms. Hima, Hiba Gurir. Um, she's a BCBA as well at Cognitive Botics. And thank you so much, Hiba, for volunteering your time and sharing your experience with uh, the article that has been chosen. So please, without further ado, please, uh, we'll give you the mic and we will quickly go through the overview of the ABA Journal Club. Now, I wanna also mention, Hiba, if I can just also inter uh, interject here, I don't want you to discuss this. Um, no so, as I talked about the introduction to the ABA Journal Club, I thanks Michelle for putting in the survey. We have a link as well for uh, being members of the ABA Journal Club. Uh, it will help you to access also the chapter as well as any you know future um, interesting uh, activities that we do as ABA Journal Club as a whole. Now. In the summary of the articles, we will be going through the background story of this article, research questions, methodology. We will discuss the results and the discussion limitations of the study. You should have an access uh, to the article. I think um, Michelle has already sent that to everyone uh, with regards to being able to have this article in hand while uh, Hiba is going through that. And then the last part of the um, CEU, we will be discussing whether this article has um, met the seven dimensions of ABA. And that's how we judge whether this article is good enough for us to use, or it needs some more uh, um, uh, support in order for us to apply this program in our clinics, let's say. And um, so without further ado, please do feel free to um, take the email, the ABA Journal Club at gmail.com. And I wanna thank again, the co-founders, we are the three BCBAs, uh, myself, Manal Aryani and the Seba Al Amri. Uh, we both uh, are supporting each other voluntarily to make the ABA Journal Club a club for all uh, specialists to come together and criticize an article. So without further ado, please, Hiba, Get the mic. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Sharifa, and thank you for having me. Um, very excited as well to see so many names. Hello, everyone. So many people that I know here. Um, Sharifa, would you like to go through these, or just should I just start ahead yeah. with that? You can go start ahead. Okay. All right. So I'm just gonna go straight away to our article. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the article assessing preference for social interaction in children diagnosed with autism, which is which was uh, done by Judy uh, Neuerberger, Sierra Smith, Nelly Zappar, and Kevin Klatt. And here are the reference, the citation for the article. So, as Sharifa mentioned, my name is Hiba Gher. I am a um, behavior analyst or certified behavior analyst, and I am currently the lead of ABA therapy department at Cognitive Botics MENA. So, let's dive ahead in 
the article. So the reason I chose this article myself is that it was always in my interest to to know more about social interactions and their effect on the behavior and how can we benefit from them uh, from working directly with kids with autism. Um, it, it is a very interesting area. So, um, this in this article, um, the assessors or the researchers um, mentioned that they chose this study in specific because children diagnosed with autism of, uh, often exhibit impaired social interaction, including a lack of social or emotional reciprocity. This study so um, sought to understand whether social interactions could function as reinforcers for children with autism, which is an area that has not been extensively explored in previous research, or at least by that time. Uh, this uh, study is, I guess, from 2012. Um, so, by conducting a preference assessment and their enforcer assessment, the study aimed to provide valuable insights into the preference and potential benefits of social interactions for children with autism. And the results showed several types of social interactions functioned as reinforcers. And here we have a, a screenshot of the first page of the article. Yeah. I would like to interject there. Uh, as, a, no uh, as you were mentioning, many people think that the huge delays in social interactions with individuals on the spectrum. However, this article I thought was very smart that they're trying to even change the mentality because we do see individuals on the spectrum having social interactions and there are different types that of social interaction that they might uh, you know uh, prefer rather than that what we think they should the way that we think should be um you know uh, the skills that we should teach them so it's important that we do look into these kind of uh, studies to expand our thoughts and you know even change some of the misconceptions uh, that could be over generalized about autism so uh, thank you so much i just wanted to share that point of course thanks sharifa So, as a background for the research, uh, starting from previous research, this study stemmed from the recognition that a deficit in social interaction is a common characteristic of autism, as outlined in the Diagnostic and Stat Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And previous literature also indicated that children with autism often display an apparent resistance to being picked up or held by parents, which is suggesting that the social interaction may not be a reinforcer for these children. However, remediating the characteristics of autism requires teaching children to engage in social interaction, prompting the need to assess whether social interactions could function as reinforcers. And some uh, this all, this article also covers uh, many ethics, uh, but ethics standards, but the most Relevant ones are task J04, selecting intervention strategies based on client preferences, and task B05, which is using alternating treatments, for example, multi-element designs. It's also called concurrent design or multiple schedule design. So the research goal here, so after conducting a stimulus preference assessment was uh, uh, using pictures of various social interactions. So the preference assessment was pictorial. We're going to talk more about it soon. And then a reinforcer assessment was conducted to determine whether the, stim the stimulus preference assessment accurately predicted whether the social interactions functioned as reinforcers. The participants were uh, three children two males and two f and one female but uh, all of them were four years old uh, all of them were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and it's important to note that um, all the children had the prerequisite were able to match pictures and uh, objects prior to the study in order to be accepted as participants the materials used in the study were a digital camera, pictures of the interactions printed on a cardstock paper, data sheets, plastic forks, spoons, spiders, color blocks, cloth spins, and clear containers. I guess these were for the sorting um, activity in the reinforcer assessment, and two timers. 
Moving on to the methodology. For the preference assessment, the data collection method, uh, first, the response selection was defined as touching one picture card after being instructed pick one. And the selection percentages were calculated by dividing the number of times a stimulus was selected by the number of trials in which in which it was available. And the average rank was computed by dividing the rank sum across sessions by the number of sessions conducted. So the results were presented in a bar graph uh, as an average rank. That's for the preference assessment. And for the reinforcer assessment, uh, the data collection method was percentage of intervals, which was calculated by dividing the number of intervals with correct responses over the number of 30 second intervals in each session multiplied by 100%. I'm going to interject there. Uh, of course. Just the, just the slide before. Can we just highlight the preference assessment versus reinforcer assessment? Okay. Uh, from my experience with lots of people in the field, especially in the Middle East, here in the UAE, many are not aware or not practicing the difference between preference assessments and reinforcer assessments in their clinics or at least when you have a case that you can figure out what's happening, um, we don't take advantage of the re uh, the reinforcer assessments that we have beautifully in the ABA field. So I just wanted to say like amazing work for this article to mention that they've done both types of assessments. Thank you. Yes, yes, I agree, definitely. Also, like the, the idea of uh, using a pictorial preference assessment for social interaction was also very smart. It deserves um, replication, I guess. So, more of data collection. It's a lot of data collection uh, for the inter observer agreement and treatment integrity. The for the preference assessment, the agreements were defined as both observers recording the same selection of each trial. And for the enforcer assessment, the agreements were, were uh, defined as both observers recording the same number of sorting responses per 30 seconds intervals. And in the end, the IOA was computed by dividing agreements by, by agreements plus disagreements and multiplying by 100%. And here is our best person, Skinner. Data is very important. Okay, um, let's describe the procedures, starting with the preference assessment first. The type of the preference assessment that used was multiple stimulus without replacement, the pictures of the experimenter, and the child engaging in these interactions were taken with a digital camera to be used in the preference assessment. Six or seven pictures were presented on a table. Um, that's because, I guess, for one of the... For one of the Participants, seven interactions were defined and for the others, only six. Uh, so there was some variation. And then each child stood next to the table and was instruct instructed to pick one. Then the pictures were shuffled in the next trial. Each, each session continued until all pictures were selected or until the child made no selection within 15 seconds after the instruction was given. And then all the pictures that were not selected, they were recorded as not selected. In terms of the reinforcer assessment, response starting with response measurement, uh, the sessions were five minute durations divided into 30 seconds intervals and the responses that were uh, taken data at, actually they were for Kate and Natasha were sorting identical items, while for Nigel, it was sorting by feature. The baseline condition in the enforcer assessment was five minute sessions or until problem or escape behavior occurred. There was no programmed consequences and only correct responses were recorded. For the intervention or the social interaction condition, also five minute sessions or until problem or escape behavior occurred. There was random selection of interactions each session. Uh, the participants were given 15 seconds access to the interaction contingent on correct responses. 
two sessions per day were conducted and only one interaction was assessed each session. This is the results of the preference assessment. I'm going to go in detail in the next slides, but in this figure, which is figure one in the article, it's the interaction mean selection rank during the preference assessment. On the Y axis, we see the average rank of selections and on the X axis, the interactions and the results uh, were percentages. The result percentages were ranked from 1, which is the lowest to 6 or 7, which is the highest for each session. And the preferences were reported as mean rank combined across either 6 or 7 sessions. And here we see Cade results for Cade on top, and then Natasha in the middle and in the bottom, Nigel. Starting with Cade, we can see there is um, a clear hierarchy uh, that was defined after the assessment. And we can see that um, the interaction carousel was defined like it looks like it's the highest preferred interaction, then followed by Chase. and Moving to the least one, which is horse ride. It's also important to remember this one, the least preferred interaction. For Natasha, we see less clear hierarchy of uh, the results. Um, the most clear one is that tickles was the most uh, preferred interaction, but for the rest, there was close averages. And for Nigel, uh, he had the best hierarchy, uh, starting with chase and swing as the most preferred interactions, ending with horse ride at the least preferred interaction. So after this, um, some key findings for the, from the preference assessment is that, as I mentioned, there was clear preference hierarchies for Kate and Nigel, but it was less evident for Natasha. And this preference assessment uh, served as valuable valuable insights for the subsequent reinforcer assessment. And here are the results of the percentage uh, of sorry of the reinforcer assessment. In general, this is figure two in the article percentage of intervals with sorting during the reinforcer assessment. On the y axis, we see percentages of intervals uh, uh, with sorting, and on the x axis. We see the sessions, the conditions were baseline, social interaction, and then based followed by baseline. So it was um, reverse multi element design within a reversal design. So for Cade, we can see that during baseline, he started with sorting around in 30% in intervals. And then it immediately uh, dropped to zero percentages. And then the intervention started and his responding ranged between 40% to 80%. And then again, during the baseline, we can see that his responding sharply increased to 100% when they went back to the um, uh, baseline condition. Uh, there are many reasons for that. It can be um, what do you call that? Uh, the um, Sharifa just here, like that. The reason for what are you? Yeah. Do you mean the baseline? Yes, in the reversal baseline. I'm just trying to uh, find that word. But anyway, we see that the responding increased after in that second baseline, but then it decreased, like reaching 30% or 20%. And we can see that he mostly responded in uh, during the sessions of Chase, which is which was his most preferred. But he also uh, the horse ride for him was the least preferred but he still responded like between 40 to 50% of intervals. Or, uh, Eba, I think, yeah. 
I just I just something came up in my mind. Yeah. It, it is a clear decrease in the trend of the yeah. baseline, right? After yeah. stop, after the removal of that social interaction uh, yeah. uh, reinforcers, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Um, same for Natasha. Also, we see she's starting with like almost 40% uh, responding in 40% of the intervals and then decreasing to around 20%. And then we see um, responding, for example, during tickles, uh, decreasing from 30% to zero towards the end. Sorry, I just can't see this. Um, and then we see the most responding was during horse ride, but then it also decreased until 20%. It was a little bit like for her, uh, there was no specific, uh, there was no clear results for her, but she still responded in all of the interactions. And then again, in the baseline conditions, her uh, responding dropped from 50% to zero towards the end. Okay, and the last one for Nigel. We see he started the responding at almost 60 to 80% during baseline and then stabilized at 10% in the last two sessions. And then his responding also ranged from what 10% to 80% during the uh, uh, intervention condition. And then Going back to the reversal baseline, his, response, uh, his responding also dropped from around 30% to 10% respectively in the last two sessions, which is also another clear uh, trend, decreasing trend of responding. Okay, so the key findings that came out of the enforcer assessment after the preference assessment is that most of the social interactions functioned as enforcers for the children with autism spectrum disorder. Lower preferred interactions can still function as reinforcers. So we can see that all of the participants, uh, they still uh, responded even in the lower preferred interactions, which like if these uh, interactions were studied a little bit more, we can we might see different results. But I also want to add a point here. Many people have a misconception that ABA use edibles. That's the only thing that is used, and that is a big, big misconception. Unfortunately, it gives a very bad name, specifically here in the Middle East and the MENA region and the African region, is that ABA is interpreted as drug training, uh, quote unquote, and, you know, articles like that should be out, you know, uh, specifically for clinical work uh, that we do that, hey, if the parents doesn't, you know, the kid has other preferences other than uh, edibles, let's look into some social interaction preferences to add to their, you know, uh, continuous motivation to learn. And I think this is this is a huge uptake from the key findings as well as the results. As a practitioner, as a supervisor here, I would definitely encourage, um, you know, RBTs, uh, BCABAs, or equivalents to that certifications to expand their preference assessments outside edibles and toys, and discover what the child loves to play with. And I think um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, did they do any indirect assessment to collect the social interactions so that they can use it in the preference assessment? So I don't know. Yes, yeah, yeah. So before the preference assessment, they um, they gave a, a questionnaire for parents and therapists to, to um, like to specify the interactions that were known as most preferred by the caregivers. But also now later when we talk about the limitations of the study and like these things, um, they also admit that this study also only focused on the, the known interactions and the most preferred interactions, while there might be more interactions that could function as uh, reinforcers. Yeah. Okay, we're coming to towards the end of the um, article here. 
speaking about the limitations that we were just discussing. So the um, researchers admitted that the preference assessment only included interactions initially thought to be preferred for each child, potentially overlooking interactions that might function as enforcers, despite not being initially identified as preferred. Uh, for example, for for Kate, the, the uh, horse ride was the least preferred, but he still responded during that condition. Uh, the second limitation defined by the by the researchers is that the enforcer assessment was restricted to a brief five minute session due the, to the time constraints, which is possibly limiting the sorting that would have occurred in longer sessions. Although experimental uh, experimental control was still demonstrated, so time constraints might have been like in the way of conducting collecting more data. Uh, also, the third limitation is that only two reinforcer assessments were conducted uh, for each interaction, again due to time constraints, potentially affecting sorting due to fluctuating preference for items on different days. Conducting more enforcer assessment sessions could provide a more accurate assessment of responding for each preferred interaction as suggested by the researchers. So, I guess here we are. Sorry, here we are. Done reviewing the article. I guess it's time for some questions and some discussion. So a question that I wanted to uh, to ask, it's actually mentioned in the uh, article, but I wanted to have it more like a discussion. So what are some future research suggestions that should be done like after knowing about this study? Uh, definitely, I think for the future research uh, suggestions is um, you know, definitely, I think uh, mitigating the issues with um, the fluctuations of preferences. Uh, what are the factors that could impact that? Is it the amount of magnitude of emotional um, voice or the number? Because again, I'm just thinking in the clinic, each therapist has a way. If we're talking about piggyback, you know, or tickles, my tickles could look totally different than your tickles, you know, and the magnitude of, I would love to see a video of this, of this article. Yeah. You know, yeah. I want to see like, does the tickle sound exaggerated, mm -hmm. you know, or like in a animated sound, you know, I would love to learn, like even looking into the different you know, um, social interactions items that has been chosen. Did the parent have an impact on, okay, make sure when you're doing tickles, you target her tummy, you know, because that's where she enjoys it, you know, or, um, you know, using bubbles, kind of bubble sound or trying to like a the monster ticklish, you know, these kind of um, play with the kiddos. But I, I'm interested because now that's kind of opened my eyes to understand all of these social interactions that have always encouraged the team you know has it does it have an impact on you know the magnitude of praising or social interaction play that we apply in our everyday clinical work um so this is one of my interest to know the magnitude of of these different and does it have an impact if we're going across therapists uh, does it have an impact on the, um, let's say, reinforcer or their um, ability to respond? We have a question, uh, Heba. Mm -hmm. I'll read it out loud, and if we need any more clarifications, uh, we can ask um, the participant to unmute themselves. It's okay if it's okay. Um, what should be considered when conducting preference assessments? knowing that they determine a rank of uh, tested items, but do not guarantee that the selected items will act as reinforcers. 
I, I think I need a bit of uh, of uh, elaboration. Gregory, yeah. if if we can, I don't know if you can unmute. I'm not sure if Michelle can can help us. If it's okay to unmute Gregory, just so that they can share their thoughts about that question. Okay. Um. I guess from my point of view, I think um. I guess more observation prior to that should be like with engaging with the item or with the activity, um, maybe taking more data on the durations, the frequency of using that. Um, but of course, we can never, like what you are saying is true, like we can never tell that this reinforce, it can be a very preferred um item but you will be surprised during the enforcer assessment that it doesn't function as a reinforcer so in my opinion reinforcer assessment even a brief one is always needed also other things that we need to keep in mind before choosing these activities or items are is like the impact of the this this thing, this activity, uh, like what, what is exactly that we are talking about? Like, is that item safe? Is it socially accepted? Is that interaction socially accepted? It does it uh, cause any, um, you know, any significant, any uh, harm to the child or to people around him. So it can be a toy that they like. It can be very like he loves it and he would do all the work for it or an edible or something, but like it can cause harm for him or people around him. So we cannot use it. So we have to also exclude that. I think also in my perspective, I think it's so important that we also consider that each day is different. You know, today my learner, uh, he, his preference today could be horseback riding, or the horsey, yeah. you know, game today, but you know, I come back tomorrow and I'm like, ah, I'm done with that. You know, I want to, yeah. I want to play with you like the tickles game today, you know, and I think with real life, you know, that we can't control our factors in our world or in our setting. I think it's important that we could consider doing consistent preference assessments when the child comes in uh, before starting an activity. You know, so that we can have that, uh, you know, and I like that the clients or the participants were able to choose using visuals. Um, and of course, that needs to be trained that the, those participants were handpicked to ensure that they had that prerequisite skill. Um, but again, for kids that don't have that ability, it's never the end of the line. We can always do a little test, and even if we can do a quick, Test uh, before uh, running that program to see whether that preference is the ultimate item to be the ranked today as number one and ensure that it acts as a reinforcer as well. You know, so again, to me, it's uh, something that as clinicians, we have to ensure that we keep that open mind, you know, that today is, you know, let me see what he wants to play with. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I would, I would, you know, do that. Um, we have Diala also mentioned the EO, establishing operations, values. You can also yeah, 100%. consider of those things as well. Um, satiation of this game, uh, things, you know, consistently talk to the parent and see like, oh, are there any new games that you guys are doing? Or there's new, um, a care, maybe a caregiver, because caregivers always, you know, spend lots of time with the with the child. So taking advantage of their knowledge is so important, especially that we are in a culture of nanny cultures. So it's important that we also consider their input, not just the parents, because sometimes they have a way to encourage the, the child to do their daily living skills that might not be the targets in the clinic, right? Um, but yeah, definitely these are things. Thank you so much everyone for sharing your inputs and your questions.
questions. Yeah, I don't see them all, but thank you. And thank you, Sherry, yeah. for your input. Okay, I guess we can also um, talk about the, uh, the second questions, which question which I thought about myself as well is how to get the best outcomes with the time restrictions, like while doing assessments, like what is the, the, the best way? Because I have had this struggle in the past as well. <laughs> so I would also like to hear about it more. I don't know what, the, what others have done. You know, we are constrained with time, you know, and parents don't understand the clinical background story, even if we try to make them understand that this is an important phase, right? But still, you are bounded with limited time in their schedule and the schedule of the clinic, um, you know, billable hours. Um, I wonder if some of our participants would share their um experiences, let's say, of how you were able to get uh, the reinforcer assessment or the preference assessment, as well as making sure that the, the, that your um, client or, or student, um, you know, get them motivated to learn within like an hour or two a day of the sessions. Now, in, in while you guys are brainstorming, I want to share um, my kind of um, ways. I definitely will be needing a little bit of consultation time with the parents to ensure that they can help me uh, with the time constraint. I mean, if it was a research, it's going to be different, but we're in a real life, right? So sometimes teaching the parents about these teaching methodologies that, hey, look, your child is doing great once you are using those kind of social interaction rather than um, just a specific toy or a specific edible. Um, <laughs> that would be nice to kind of share their input as well and get them on board. I mean, I know parents sometimes, and again, I would love to hear from anyone that's a parent here, uh, what are their thoughts to take this idea and implement it at home? You know, so, all right, so let's say, you know, Omar is going to put on his shoes and puts us on his shoes and we make a huge social interaction game for that. That would be an interesting, maybe, maybe could be something that the parents can support. We have Aman also uh, shared. Thank you so much for sharing your idea here. Uh, she says brief and quick preference assessment with multiple items at the beginning of every session or between sessions. Uh, and it's a it's a wonderful idea. You know, checking in, doing like, okay, what do you want to play with? Do you want to do tickles or do you want to do, uh, you know, catching? And so that will help to kind of check in with the student from time to time to make sure they're also motivated to learn. Yeah, that's a very good idea as well. Yeah, like if if the if the child is not ready, uh, I think there is no point of like going ahead and continuing. Do we have to make sure like choose the best, the right time to start, the right setting, the right place? Um, from knowing this child, like when is his best time for responding, um, making sure the environment is controlled, uh, being there prepared, uh, practiced. I always suggest to practice before doing the, especially the enforcer assessment, because it can be a little bit confusing. So, Absolutely. yeah, and, and as you said, data, 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 you know, <laughs> of and, course, you know, like practicing that on the floor is important, even if it was like shorthanded, just so that you can see the response of your child. Um, we have Sobia. She said, yes, it's great to interact with parents because they should know how to do work with their child and how to get them motivated um, to to learn and to do the everyday life skills. And I think that is so important. Um, if the parents knew that there is a specific interaction ways and we can explore that 
and bringing the attention to the parent that maybe we are not interacting enough. You know, we're not coming up with creative ideas and observe and see what is something that will reinforce the continuation of a specific um, skill or response. And it would be interesting to, to hear as well from therapists or caregivers or nannies, you know, very simple questions like, so do you play with, do you try to play with your child? What do they like to do, you know, or what do they like to do so that you can make them laugh? You know, simple questions like that, I think would be awesome to put as part of our like intake questionnaires. Um, what are the things that you that they love to do with their siblings or things like that that will kind of brainstorm that there are some social interaction skills or social interaction preferences that could be used as a reinforcer and hopefully that will help us to boost the child's skills uh, and hopefully that will be fitted out. Uh, and I was wondering, that was another question that came to my mind that I now remembered that these social interaction takes a lot of energy from parents, from, you know, therapists. And we need to come to a point where I can't <laughs> for every response to a tickle game, you know, so th this is one of my questions that maybe in the future research we can, you know, think about is. How can we then fade out these um, preferences and to and as well ensure the maintenance of the skill? Because as we can see in the in the results, once they stopped it, cold cut, we saw a drop in the skill. And I thought that was alarming because then is that what they're we're gonna do for the rest of their lives? It shouldn't, because that's not real life. You know, and how we can use that to pair it maybe with real life um, reinforcers, I guess. Another question, I maybe. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, answering your question, um, my thought is like once we start dealing with social interactions as any other enforcer, just like tokens, just like edibles or toys, then we can deal with them like maybe uh, thinning schedules or, uh, you know, trying different schedules of reinforcement to fade out uh, in the reinforcement like, like, uh, frequency of that. Because as you said, yes, it can be very hectic and you can see like therapists starting the session very excited, giving all these tickles, all this uh, attention. And then towards the end, they get tired and start to get less, less, uh, less interesting, you know, for both of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So even planning, planning the reinforcer and we need to make sure that we are planning it well, because we don't want to drop of responses because we did it too quick, you know, uh, and that is the difficult part because you're then, um, that's going to be really detailed with your therapist to ensure that when is our next uh, step? What is the criteria to move on to the next schedule? Um, compile, uh, so Chrisma has a kind of comment here. We can compile a list of potential reinforcers beforehand to minimize time spent deciding during the session and set up the assessment area with the items or the stimuli you plan to present it before we start with those things. So having again, plan, 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 you know, we, uh, our jobs as, as, as behavior analysts, as behavior therapists, whatever the title is, is that we need to always plan ahead. You know, and it is part of making a successful program. Um, and that skill is actually a skill to be learned. Not everyone has that skill to plan ahead of yes. these yes. Of, of these things, uh, of these uh, items, uh, potential reinforcers. Uh, but definitely that is that is one way to help um, maybe help with the time restrictions issue there. 
Yay, seven dimensions. I love all these baby. thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is one of the greatest things about the ABE Journal Club is that we like to criticize and that's what we do, you know? So we wanna make sure that our article meets the seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis. And I love this visual. So we'll go through it one by one so that we can discuss and score it out of seven. Um, so generality, do we score, you know, one, you can give a score and then we will see how many of the dimensions they have, um, let's say, meet, and then we're going to score them out of seven. So that's the fun part at the end of our um, ABA Journal Club. So, number one, generality. Do you want to do you want to explain what generality is, Hiba? Yeah, for sure. So generality is uh, a behavioral change that may be said to have generality if it if it proves durable over time. And if it appears in a wide variety of possible environment and or if it spreads to a wide variety of related behaviors. Yes. So, so... If, the, if the behavior can be generalized over time and environments, so we are call we, it. If we connect this to the article that we are reading, are we looking at the, the responses? that they try to increase yes. to ensure that they've mentioned generality. I haven't seen any follow-ups of those skills that they were working on. Have you, Hiba? Yeah, no, not really, not really. Okay, so everyone, get your, your numbers ready, yes or no. So what do you guys think? I would say no. Maybe that's something in the future they should be talking about, how to generalize these skills. Yes. Um, and generalize maybe the topic to parents, caregivers, because that's the whole point of what we're doing today. What do you guys think? Generality, yes or no? I would love to hear what you guys think about if anyone says yes or, you know, I understand why no, but I would really love to hear your input about why do you think this article did meet generality? Um, just like looking, I'm skimming through the article again, just to make sure I haven't missed anything. Again, uh, you know, Hiba would be the best one because she went deep dive into the article. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I haven't seen a phase, like I haven't seen a phase, like a photo of phase, let's say, or. Yeah, what do you think? I think that also comes in the future suggestions. So I guess the researchers were aware of this. Um, so doing more of these uh, reinforcer assessments, uh, doing it on a. Under different variations, maybe different locations, people, longer durations. Yeah. All right, moving on. So we'll just say no for that. Okay. Yeah, no. Next. So effective is that so effective uh, dimension of ABA is that interventions are effective when they improve a behavior in a particular in a particular matter. If the application of behavioral techniques, the techniques does not produce large enough effects for practical value, then the application has failed. Oh, I definitely feel it has been effective. I mean, the number is 0 to 50. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. Yeah. yeah, I think this was very uh, evident through the also it was very smart to do this uh, reversal design. Like we could see the difference immediately. Absolutely. I think so everyone agrees on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next. Technological. So if the procedures are described clearly and concisely to so that others may implement the procedures accurately, all steps are written in details to get the desired results. So that is 100% yes, I would say. I would be I can so do it comfortable. Tomorrow. Yeah, I was so comfortable. I was like, okay, I'm going to take this article, tell my team, let's apply this, you know? 
I've actually, um, uh, um, I've done this before. <laughs> I've replicated on a very small scale, like with one wow. client only. <laughs> cool. This is what yeah. the ABA Journal Club is about. Yeah. You know, yeah. that we want to, you know, take those articles and apply it in our clinics, even if it's a small scale. Yeah, this is right. exactly yeah. what BCBAs should be doing. Exactly. So it is technological. Is it applied? So a behavior change is applied when it enhances and improves the everyday life of a learner and those who are closest to the learner, parents, siblings, or peers by improving a socially significant behavior. Hmm. Um, I would say yes. Because we're also moving away from uh, tangible reinforcers, uh, yeah. emphasizing the more natural reinforcers. So I think yes. Definitely. And I think it would be nice to see the responses being not just sorting, maybe uh, something more, you know, bigger. For like daily mm -hmm. things, uh, daily living skills, but definitely yes. True. Conceptually systematic. So interventions are consistent with the principles demonstrated in the literature and the research. And it is important that practitioners continue to use research based techniques and avoid using any shortcuts in our teaching methods. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It is conceptually systematic and I guess it is analytic where the practitioner is able to show that whenever he or she applies a certain variable, a behavior is produced and whenever he or she removes the, this variable, the behavior is lost. That is 100 percent. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And the last one is behavioral. The behavior chosen must also be observable and measurable by defining by defining a behavior that makes it easily observable and measurable. We are able to study it uh, for proof of improvement as well as lack of improvement. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So <laughs> yes. the score for this article is six out of seven. Six out of seven. Yes. This is a really high number. You know, having yeah. an article that meets all the seven dimensions of ABA is very rare. So I'm really, really happy to see this article. And thanks for this choice, Haba. Well done. Of course. And Thank you so everyone. much. So Thank we, you. We Thank you all for program. being here. So the last code word. Again, I want to take this advantage to thank Hiba. Thank you so much. This is your first time for volunteering yes, with us. Is. You did an amazing <laughs> yeah. job. I am just so thank impressed how you so really broke down the article. Like, really, it helps us to think out of the box as well. Um, I just want to show the email slide. So, if you go back, uh, next slide, please do yeah. feel free to. Um, thanks, Michelle, for sending us the the links. So, the links we have for the evaluation um, for our awesome uh, moderator here and our uh, our beautiful Hiba. So you guys can let Thank us you. know how we can do better. And I'm sure it's not gonna be our, our last one Hiba. So we definitely yeah. hear from others to see like, what can we do better? Um, also for the CEUs, this is the form link. Please do um, make sure that you put your codes in. And then we would like to also if you would like to join our ABA Journal Club, please feel free to um, fill the form and please do join also our ABA Journal Club, uh, sorry, the ABA UAE um, chapter in the UAE. So please do um, register and so that you can also be part of our ongoing development of our awesome growing, let's say, behavior analysts in the UAE. So I just want to thank again everyone. I want to thank ECE. I want to thank Dr. Michelle Kelly for really supporting the AB Journal Club and number 10. Like this is amazing. So thank you so much for supporting. And hopefully we'll see you guys next time in the next quarter, which will be coming up. We will be sending our next one coming soon. 
uh, as another a volunteer. So if you are interested to be part of the volunteers for article revision, please don't hesitate to contact us and add your name. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone. Thank you Sharifa. Thank you Michelle. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.